In a previous module, I described how many medical students are taught during their basic science years. The massive amounts of information they must learn is often taught and organized in structures related to organ systems or broad topics like cancer, collagen vascular disease, heart disease, etc. Physicians, however, organize their data into more clinically relevant structures based upon their patient's signs, symptoms, laboratory, and other findings. As you teach medical students, you are helping them reorganize their knowledge into a more useful structure that they will be able to use for the rest of their careers. In the remainder of this short module, I will review the general principles of clinical reasoning used by physicians as they diagnose and manage their patients. While there may be a few minor differences in some details, most medical educators agree with the basic concepts which I will present. The audio track for these slides comes from a presentation I gave to clinical teaching faculty in Thomasville, Georgia in July 2013. So if I were to take a student and they were to watch one of you all in your practice and you, you, know, you would see a patient and, and the patient comes in with some renal complaint and you, know, you do all this stuff and then you sit there and you think for a while and you basically come up with a diagnosis. Most of the time these students, at least young students, they're just, they're, they have no clue what you just did. It just happened. You're the, you, this is you. How did, how did this turn into this? There's some interesting literature and, and studies going on about this whole process of clinical reasoning. As we go from being novices, students and residents, to experts, we actually gather less information when we see patients. And we're more accurate. So isn't that, that that's kind of a paradox, okay? Um, but that's what we do. People have studied this, okay? Anybody know who this is? Have anybody read this guy's book? Jerome Groupman. If you haven't read it, it's great. I mean, um, he wrote this book not for physicians. He wrote it for just regular folks. But he's a physician, and he talks about mistakes that we make as, as physicians, and it's based upon the way we think. It it's basically shows that, well, I'm, I'm talking about the basic ways that physicians think about patients and how we approach patients. And that's a good thing for us. We have to do that. And we want our students to learn that. We've got to be careful because we can make mistakes. The first way that doctors think, and this is the way students are taught, when they, this is the way they think medicine works, hypothesis testing, okay? Basically, it means, you know, every, well, here, I tried to make this up. So this is all possible diagnosis on this axis. Just think of every diagnosis known to man. And up here is all possible signs, symptoms, lab findings, or whatever. And so, you know, you gather exhaustive amounts of data, okay? And they would come up with something like this, okay? And then you just go through, okay, the one with the most X's wins. There's the one with the most X's. That's, that must be the diagnosis, okay? That's analytic thinking. That's, that's hypothesis testing. You're just simply going through and finding the one that has the best match. And we sometimes do that. When we have a really weird patient, I'll have somebody come into ID clinic who's ha had some, a very strange constellation of symptoms. Nothing fits. I have to do that, okay? More, the, more what we do is something called forward thinking. It's, it's like when you, from the moment you see the chart and then you start talking to the patient or they talk to you and you listen to what they're saying, there's little forks in the road in your mind that you're going through. So if the chief complaints thrombocytopenia, the first thing that I, I remember, and I'm, again, I'm not a hematologist, well, is it a production problem or is it a, destruction problem. And so as I go through and I evaluate the patient, I'm thinking of various things that will help direct me into that which way I go. I see somebody with hematuria, is it brown urine or is it red urine? Upper or lower tract, okay? And, and then you start making these decisions on the fly. It's like you're doing your clinical reasoning while you're in the middle of gathering your information. It's called forward thinking. The other thing is called pattern recognition. You have any idea what this might be? 
Zoster, shingles. Yeah, it's, it's hard to see. It does, the, the, the red doesn't come out. So you've got this unilateral vesicular rash. Exactly. How did you know that? You've seen it before. And they call that the Aunt Minnie. It's, it, and I don't know how it got in there, but somebody wrote an article about their Aunt Minnie. And Aunt Minnie had a certain way to walk across. And whenever you saw somebody from a distance, they knew it was Aunt Minnie because of the way that person looked. Okay? And that's stuck. It's weird. But that's stuck. How do we know that shingles? You just know it. You walk in the room. You see that. You, you know, what's the point of taking, you know, 10 minutes of history? Okay? I mean, there's still some questions to ask. I'm not trying to minimize that. But you got the diagnosis, okay? Because you know what it looks like. That's called pattern recognition. The other thing we do is we have something called illness scripts. So you know when you have a patient that comes in with, uh, I'll use my pediatric background. If somebody comes in with abdominal pain, okay? A child with chronic abdominal pain, which is not an unusual thing that we see in kids, okay? I'm thinking constipation, I'm thinking other things. One of the questions I might ask is, does it wake them up at night? If it wakes them up at night in the middle of a sleep, that is not typically functional abdominal pain. That's something that's, that's, that's maybe there's an ulcer or some kind of something like that, okay? So I've learned these certain patterns. I've learned certain questions that have high yield, okay? And, and as, you, as you go through your career, you learn that stuff through experience uh, or through your colleagues or whatever. You've just learned certain things. Um, that's called illness scripts. When you go back and you look at this diagram, what's really happening when you go from novice to expert is you're using more of these things and you're using less hypothesis testing. Because this is inefficient, this is slow, this is fast. And it's, and it, and it's very clear, that's what we do as physicians. The problem we get into, and this is what Dr. Grootman talks about, is when, we, when something doesn't totally fit the pattern, we say, well, it's just a variant, you know, it's, an, it's whatever. And, and sometimes we're busy, we'll overlook the things that are not right fitting right and we sort of go down the wrong path so but the bottom line is students need to if, if they could see this when you're teaching them if you could point out these things the script this is an illness this is something you should remember this pattern see, that's what I'm talking about this is this is what we're starting to do in medicine now and I think it's a good idea I don't know if you can teach this but you can at least teach them about it and teach them about this is how you think I'm not sure there's a shortcut to this because I think you've got to know the underlying basic sciences and stuff first. Well, it's interesting. Um, nobody knows if doing that, it's like if you teach your kid to read when they're th uh, four, or you teach your kid to read when they're six, are they going to be reading any better when they're age 12? Okay. You know, are they going to be better because they know that? I don't know. But I think it's helpful for them to see the structure upon which they're going to put their information. So I think calling it to their attention is a great, it's a great approach.